Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the James D. Julia Auction House up in Maine, taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming spring, or April, of 2017 auction. They have some really interesting things here, and in particular this Polish Unicorn Rifle. This is a WZ-28M, and it's the result of some Polish Army semi-auto rifle trials that took place just before World War II which of course were, not surprisingly, cut short by the dual invasion from Russia and Germany. Now, to break this down a little bit, WZ stands for Vizor, uh, or model, 20, uh, 38 is of course the year, 1938, and M stands for the designer, who is named Maracek. His full name was actually Josef Maracek, and uh, he enrolled in 1923 in the Warsaw Technical University, studied arms design, and finally graduated with a thesis in 1930 on modernizing and updating the Polish Mauser, the WZ-29 bolt-action rifle. He was then employed by the military, basically, and, and various arms factories. They decided they were interested in his, his version of the updated Mauser, and so he was hired to build some prototypes and start testing them, and that project didn't really go anywhere, and ultimately his rifle, they weren't quite able to finalize it and get it working just right. However, right about the time that that, was fine, that project finally ended, the Polish army announced a competitive trial for self-loading rifles, semi-auto rifles. And there weren't really actually all that many criteria. Uh, some pretty basic stuff. Had to have a 600 millimeter barrel, same as the Mauser. Uh, had to weigh no more than four and a half kilos, or basically 10 pounds. Had to have a 10 round magazine firing eight by 57 Mauser ammunition, because that was what was standard for the Polish military at the time. And then it had to, uh, Basically, I had to do what everyone wanted semi-auto rifles to do. It had to be cheap and easy to produce, simple to operate, not that many parts, basic stuff. So, um, in the end, when they, they announced these trials in early 1934, and uh, rifles had to be submitted by December 1st, 1934, when they were, they got like nine different entries. Unfortunately, Polish archives are pretty sparse on, on material about this, largely because the Polish military archives were ransacked like 18 different times through the course of World War II by pretty much everybody. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't even know much about the other competitive guns. They were all identified by basically abbreviations or code names. So in many cases, it's not even known who designed them. But of all of these guns, three were chosen to continue onward, and Maracek was one of them. Now this was an, at this point, this was an early Maracek rifle design and it actually was third place of the three that went on. It wasn't all that great. It still had some functional problems to it. And in the meantime, Maracek had also started working on an anti-tank rifle, which would become adopted as the WZ-35UR for Uruguay. That's a different issue. We'll get into one of those later on. Uh, but Maracek didn't have a whole lot of time on hand to, to fix his semi-auto rifle, the anti-tank rifle was kind of taking most of his attention. But then, like right at the end of the trials period in 35, he kind of had this sudden inspiration for a great way to redesign the rifle and make it better. And he, his proposal was, was looked at and they went, well, one seems actually like a pretty reasonable set of ideas. We'll give you six weeks to redesign the rifle from scratch and resubmit it, which is like no time whatsoever. I mean, six weeks is like the design time frame of the Sten gun. But Maracek and a couple of teammates were able to actually go through and do this, and they produced a new prototype which used this, it was a prototype of this rifle. And this is really a remarkably fantastic gun, and the military recognized that as well. Ultimately, by 1937, five prototypes were taken for testing. That went quite well, and in 38, they ordered 55 of them to be manufactured for troop trials. Those were supposed to be delivered by January 1st, 1939. Now, they were delivered. This is serial number 1048. Um, all the known guns fall into the serial number range of 1001 through 1055. Uh, there's no further paper trail in the Polish archives after that order and delivery date, so we don't know what happened there, but we do know, of course, in September, World War II started with the invasion of Poland, and you can understand why no further development took place. Um, that also explains why the Germans didn't produce this gun to make it, because at that point this thing was only still a troop trials gun, it wasn't actually in mass production anywhere. In 
So there are only a couple of markings on this rifle, and the main one is right here on top of the receiver. It is ZBR2 and 1938. 1938 is the date, of course. ZBR2 was for a long time kind of a mystery. It turns out it's the name of the arsenal where the rifle is manufactured. Zbrojovnia 2, which literally translates in Polish as Arsenal Number 2. Uh, this is where Maracek was working in Warsaw. There's also this. This is a very small marking that you will see repeated on the inside of the gun in a number of places. It looks like a Z in a circle, which is potentially going to cause some confusion as that is a check proof mark. However, this is not actually a Z, it's actually a 2, reference ZBR2, it's a 2 in a circle. So you'll actually find this same mark on Marichek's anti-tank rifles, which were also manufactured by Arsenal No. 2 in Warsaw. Lastly, we have a serial number on the left side of the receiver. This is number 1048, they started at 1001 and went to 1055. You'll find that 48 repeated a number of places here, for example, on the, uh, the lower assembly of the gun, and lots of places on the inside, which you'll see in a minute. Lastly, we have selector markings here. It's a two-position selector. This rifle was semi-automatic only. Um, a little counterintuitively to us, the zero is actually the fire position, and Z is the safe position. Now, when we take a closer look at this thing, you'll start to see elements from other guns in it. Uh, Czech, Polish, a variety of of interesting influences. And the first one is right here in the disassembly lever. This is extremely reminiscent of the Polish BAR, well, BARs in general. And that makes sense because the Poles were actively manufacturing and using their own version, the WZ-28 version of the BAR. So for Maracek to have copied that takedown lever makes perfect sense. And of course the beginning of takedown is to rotate this 90 degrees down and then it is a keyed lever, so there's a little nub right there. It comes out, and then we can continue with disassembly. Next up, I'm going to remove the trigger group, um, and that's super easy. We pull the pin out, this simply rotates down and out of the gun. The magazine is fixed in place, fire control mechanism is back here. We'll take a closer look at that in just a moment. But first, our next disassembly step is to remove the gas piston and handguard. It is dovetailed in here um, in another very, very reminiscent tie-in to some other guns. So we're just going to slide this forward. And then this is actually going to lift out with the operating rod. That comes out. We just pull the operating rod out, and then you've got those two assemblies right there. Last but not least, we can take the bolt out. And once the op rod's out, the bolt just slides right out of the receiver, kind of like a BAR there as well. Yep. Now when you look at the hooks on the bolt here, this is very reminiscent of the ZB26 and the ZH29 rifles, so some check gun influence there. And that's it. This is a really impressive gun in that it is extremely quick and simple to take apart. It disassembles into a number of large discrete pieces. The closest thing you have to a small easily lost component is this takedown pin, but even that's not too bad. One pin holds the whole thing together. This is a really slick design by Maracek, and had the war not continued on, I think it really would have gone somewhere. So the locking system on this rifle is really kind of a hybrid between the ZB26 um, and some other guns like it, and the, the Petter Model 1935A French pistol, uh, and some other pistols like it, in that the bolt tilts up and down, so this is the unlocked position, and then when the carrier goes forward, these sloped surfaces at the back lift the back of the bolt up like that, and then this surface right here, right there, that shiny bit at the top of the bolt, that locks into the top of the receiver, right here in this cutout. Uh, now in the Petter pistols, that was the barrel locking into the slide, in this case, it's the bolt locking into the receiver, but the, the principle is the same. The recoil spring is held here inside the operating rod assembly, so it cycles in and out like that. The guide rod for the spring runs inside the gas piston, and then we have a little cross pin here that locks it in place. I, I'm not going to pull that off, there's no need, but it's a really slick captive uh, recoil spring, and it drops into and out of the receiver extremely easily, no chance of losing it. The handguard here 
has this pin that locks it into the receiver. So this locks the upper receiver, the trigger group, and the handguard, which is also the gas tube, all together with one pin. That's efficient and effective. And then we have a gas tube up here. There's the back. The gas piston is going to ride inside that, just like so. All the way forward, cycles backward. And then what's kind of interesting is we actually have an adjustable gas system. So the front here is a just a threaded plug, and it's only finger tight, which I'll explain why in a moment. All right, so there's a hole in the barrel right there, vents gas into that, and then there is just a slightly tapered plug that is going to control the amount of gas that comes from this hole through into the gas tube. And it's, actually let me show you here, if we can zoom in on this, the gas plug is actually numbered on three facets, number one, number two, and number three. Now, I'm not sure exactly why that was, because in changing from one to two to three, you're getting, you're, you're closing this tapered plug by an increment of one eighth of its thread pitch, so you're getting really just this minuscule amount of change, and I, that's not enough change to, for example, um, tune the rifle to different uh, say different bullet weights or different types of ammunition. This was still a troop trials gun at this point, so it might just be in an effort to get the rifle running just right on the specific ammunition that they were using for the trials. Um, there's this score mark on the front of the gas tube, and that's what allows you to line up the one, the two, or the three. And then what's cool is it doesn't have to be tightened down into place because once you put this onto the gun, that prevents these flats um, can't turn against the barrel. The rear sight on the Marichek is basically identical to that of a Mauser bolt-action carbine or bolt-action rifle, which isn't surprising because that's what the Poles were using and clearly they liked it. The front sight is also basically identical to what they had on their Mausers. Then it's also interesting to note that there is a simplistic muzzle brake cut into the front of the barrel right there. Now, some other rifles of this period had that. Uh, the SVTs, the Russian SVTs, had muzzle brakes actually kind of similar to this, uh, but most other self-loading rifles of the period, military ones, did not. Looking at this, you'll notice some more 48s. So it's marked 48 on the upper handguard here, there. Uh, it's marked 48 on the face of the bolt handle there. The magazine here is not removable. This is permanently fixed into the base of the rifle, so there's a stripper clip guide on the top of the receiver. Right there. It's actually the stripper clip guide is the same surface, or the rear of it is the same surface that is the locking surface. This of course holds 10 rounds of 8 Mauser. In fact, you can kind of see this optical illusion at the back. You'd think that this is one solid piece of metal, but it's actually not. It's slightly deeper here than it is down at the bottom. Fire control group is pretty simple. Uh, interestingly, this is one of those rifles that locks open on an empty magazine and you actually pull the trigger to close the, the bolt. So you have to load the magazine via stripper clip, then pull the trigger and it will close the bolt and your next, your next trigger pull will fire the rifle. So that's, that was something that a number of different people did at this time period. That was seen as a simplistic, convenient and efficient type of uh, control for a rifle. And the bolt handle is non-reciprocating. So. Bolt handle is very reminiscent of a BAR. Slides open like this, but it does not cycle when you fire the rifle. So it just acts as a lever with which you can uh, push the bolt backwards. You can see this little nub right there. The other interesting thing, you'll notice there's a little cutout right here, and the bolt handle actually rotates slightly. That allows you to use this to manually lock the bolt open. There's a tab connected to the bolt handle, and so if this were under spring pressure and I wanted to lock the rifle open uh, without the magazine being empty, I can pull the bolt handle back, rotate it down, and it will hold it in place like that. With the gun now reassembled, you can see that locking system working when I pull the bolt handle back. The bolt drops down right there out of its locked position, and then it will cycle backwards. Now I'm not going to actually demonstrate dropping the bolt uh, by pulling the trigger because it's meant to be done when you reload the magazine. 
And if you don't have, if you have the magazine empty and you want to do this, you have to hold the follower down while pulling the trigger. And if you, you then also have to hold the bolt handle when you do that, or it'll drop onto your finger that's holding the follower down. So it's kind of a three-handed tricky maneuver that isn't easily done on film. But um, that is how the thing functions. So to me, the Marichek really is one of these interesting rifles that didn't get taken into service, but not actually for any real fault of its own. It didn't get into service because German and Soviet invasions of Poland interrupted its development cycle. Usually when you see a cool looking trials gun like this, if it didn't go into service, it is usually a good reason. It was had some huge terrible flaw. The Marichek, as far as I can tell, is a really nice rifle. Um, the reports I've seen uh, from people who have shot them, because by the way, apparently there is a gunsmith in Poland who has made just a couple of hand-built reproductions of these. Apparently they're a very nice cycling rifle. I'm really impressed by the simplicity and the ease of field stripping and the major components that you're, you end up with once the gun's stripped. Compared to its the, the other guns available at the time in the 1930s, it's really ahead of its time. It's really well done. Um, you know, taking this apart makes an M1 look like a jigsaw puzzle, really. So had it not been for World War II, Poland might have ended up with a really nice service, semi-auto service rifle by the end of the 1930s. Of course, that's a, you know, a, a could have been that we can't change now. So as I had mentioned, there are five of these still known to exist today, with rumors, I believe, about two others. Uh, two of those are in Poland, two of them are in the United States, one of them is in Germany. So if you're interested in having a Marichek rifle in your own collection, uh, you're not going to have too many opportunities at this one. And this particular rifle is a magnificent example. It's in fantastic condition. I don't see any reason it wouldn't be shootable, um, although simply because of the scarcity, I'm not going to go out and shoot this one. Uh, but if you'd like to yourself, uh, make sure to check the description text below for a link to the James Julia auction page or catalog page on this rifle. It is coming up for sale in their April spring of 2017 auction and if you'd like it, place a bid on it. Uh, take a look at their high res pictures on Julia's website if you're interested. Thanks for watching.